Okay, now we come to Sutta number 15, uh, Majima Nikaya. It's called the Anumana Sutta. Inference, that's the title. Uh. Mm. We're using this book uh, by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh. The only thing is sometimes uh, some of the words, uh, I'm not so happy, uh, I change a bit. Uh. Mm. That's have I heard. On one occasion, the Venerable Maha Mogalana was living in the Baga country at Sung Sumara Gira in the base of Kala Grove, the Deer Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Friends, monks, friend, they replied. The Venerable Maha Mogalana said this, Friends, though a monk asked thus, Let the Venerable Ones admonish me. I need to be admonished by the Venerable Ones. Yet, if he is difficult to admonish and possesses qualities that make him difficult to admonish, if he is impatient and, and does not take instruction rightly, then his companions in the holy life think that he should not be admonished or instructed. They think of him as a person not to be trusted. I stop here for a moment. Huh? Mahamogalana is one of the uh, very senior disciples of the Buddha, uh, so sometimes he gives uh, Dhamma talks to the other monks. La. The translation uh, here, uh, this uh, friend uh, is Avuso. La. During the Buddha's time, the monks address each other as Avuso. La. Sometimes it's as translated as friend, like here. Sometimes it's translated as venerable. Uh. So, uh, or reverend. Uh, so here Venerable uh, Mahamogalana says, uh, even though sometimes a monk uh, asked to be admonished, la, to be told his faults, la, uh, but if he has qualities uh, that make him difficult to admonish, uh, then uh, the other monks uh, would be reluctant to admonish him. La. If he is impatient, does not take instruction, uh, rightly uh, so since it is difficult to admonish him uh, other monks uh, will not want to admonish him lah. now in the uh, Vinaya books uh, uh, in the Mahavaga chapter 1 uh, when a new monk comes to train under a teacher uh, because a new monk uh, is supposed to spend 5 years under a teacher lah, and um, if he possesses certain qualities, uh, the teacher is supposed to dismiss him, uh, throw him out. Uh, if he possesses one of five qualities, uh, one is he does not have much faith in the teacher. Uh, number two, uh, he does not have much respect for the teacher. Number three, he does not have much affection for the teacher. Number four, he does not have a sense of shame. Uh, towards the teacher, uh, not much la, sense of shame towards the teacher. Number five, he does not have much development or progress under the teacher. Uh, and the teacher is supposed to chase him away, la, dismiss him. La, uh. So, uh, so that's why like, uh, if a uh, certain monk uh, is difficult to admonish, uh, then others will not admonish him. La. Now the sutta continues. Uh, what qualities make him difficult to admonish? Here a monk has evil wishes and is dominated by evil wishes. This is a quality that makes him difficult to admonish. Again, a monk lords himself and disparages others. This is a quality that makes him difficult to admonish. 3. Again, a monk is angry and is overcome by anger. Number 4. A monk is angry and revengeful. Number five, a monk is angry and stubborn. Number six, a monk is angry and utters words bordering on anger. Number seven, a monk is reproved and he resists the re reprover. Number eight, a monk is reproved and he denigrates the reprover. Number nine, a monk is reproved and he counter reproves the reprover. Number ten, a monk is reproved and he pre prevaricates, leads the talk aside and shows anger, hate and bitterness. Number 11. A monk is reproved and he fails to account for his conduct. Number 12. A monk is contemptuous and domineering. 
13. Among is envious and avaricious. 14. Among is fraudulent and deceitful. 15. Among is obstinate and arrogant. 16. Among adheres to his own views, holds on to them tenaciously, and relinquishes them with difficulty. This is a quality that makes him difficult to admonish. Monks, uh, friends, these are called the qualities that make him difficult to admonish. Mm, stop here for a while. Huh? So here there are 16 qualities uh, uh, that make a monk uh, difficult to admonish. Huh? Number one, he has evil wishes. Maybe uh, he desires to be famous. Huh? He wants fame huh? uh, or any other evil wish. Huh? Uh, number two, uh, he lords himself, uh, dis praises himself, uh, and puts down others, uh, disparages others, uh, mm, ego. Number three, uh, the monk is angry, uh, he cannot control, overcome by anger, cannot control his temper. Uh. Number four, a monk is angry and revengeful. Uh. If, you, if you admonish him, uh, he might want to take revenge. Uh. Number five, a monk is angry and stubborn. Uh. Stubborn probably doesn't want to change. La. Number six, the monk is angry and utters words bordering on anger. Uh, so he speaks angry words back. La. Number seven, the monk is reproved and he resists the reprover. Tries to defend himself, huh? does not want to admit. Number eight, the monk is reproved and he denigrates the reprover. And so when you admonish him, huh, he talks bad about you. La. Number nine, a monk is reproved and he counter reproves the reprover. So you, you tell him his fault, nah, he'll tell you back your fault. Nah. Ten, a monk is reproved and he prevaricates and leads the talk aside and shows anger, hate and bitterness. Nah. Nah. So when you when you tell him his fault, nah, he speaks or acts evasively. Nah. Number eleven, a monk is reproved and he fails to account for his conduct. Hmm. He does not want to account for his, his uh, failings. La. Twelve, a monk is contemptuous and domineering. Mm. Mm. Arrogant, uh, domineering. Thirteen, envious and avaricious. La. Mm. Extremely greedy, la. will not change. La. Fourteen, fraudulent and deceitful. La. Uh, this one is very important. If a, if a, if a disciple la, is fraudulent and deceitful, la, is he doesn't want to show his faults to the teacher, la then the teacher cannot make him improve. La. A person uh, who wants to learn, who wants to improve, uh, progress on the spiritual path, uh, he has got to be very straightforward. Uh, whatever faults he has, uh, he has got to expose them to the teacher, uh, not, not, not be deceitful. La. 15. Obstinate and arrogant, stubborn uh, and haughty. 16. Adheres to his own views, holds on to them tenaciously. La. Will not change his views. La. You tell him his, his, his wrong views, he will not change. La. So these are the qualities. Uh, if a monk possesses these qualities, uh, then his companions in the holy life would not want to admonish him because he doesn't want to be admonished, he doesn't want to improve. La. And Venerable Maha Moglana continues. La. Friends, though a monk does not ask us, let the Venerable Ones admonish me. I need to be admonished by the Venerable Ones. Yet, if he is easy to admonish and possesses qualities that make him easy to admonish, if he is patient and takes instruction rightly, then his companions in the holy life think that he should be admonished and instructed, and they think of him as a person to be trusted. Mm -hmm. What qualities make him easy to admonish? Here, a monk has no evil wishes and is not dominated by evil wishes. This is a quality that makes him easy to admonish. Again, a monk does not lord himself nor disparage others. Number three, he is not angry nor allows anger to overcome him. Four, he is not angry or revengeful. Five, not angry or stubborn. Six, not angry and does not utter words bordering on anger. Seven, when reproved, he does not resist the reprover. When reproved, he does not denigrate the reprover. When reproved, he does not counter reproof. He is reproved and he does not prevaricate, lead the talk aside and show anger, hate and bitterness. When reproved, he does not fail to account for his conduct, as he explains himself. Twelve, he is not contemptuous or domineering. 
13. He is not envious or avaricious. 14. He is not fraudulent or deceitful. 15. He is not obstinate or arrogant. Again, the monk does not adhere to his 16. He does not adhere to his own views or hold on to them tenaciously and he relinqu relinquishes them easily. This is a quality that makes him easy to admonish. Friends, these are called the qualities that make him easy to admonish. Um, stop here for a moment. So here the converse, uh, um, if a monk uh, is easy to admonish, uh, makes himself admonishable, uh, then uh, other monks uh, uh, observes uh, that he is willing to be uh, reproved, uh, willing to change, uh, then the other monks uh, will uh, want to help him uh, and tell him his faults. Uh. Now friends, a monk ought to infer about himself in the following way. 1. A person with evil wishes and dominated by evil wishes is displeasing and disagreeable to me. If I were to have evil wishes and be dominated by evil wishes, I would be displeasing and disagreeable to others. A monk who knows this should arouse his mind thus, I shall not have evil wishes and be dominated by evil wishes. Similarly, for the other qualities, huh? um, he thinks huh, if uh, he has... Uh, if a person has these um, evil qualities, uh, then uh, he is displeasing. Uh, and if he himself has these qualities, uh, he is also displeasing to the others. Uh, so he changes, uh, uh, does not allow himself uh, to have these evil qualities. Uh. So for a person to change himself, uh, first he has to acknowledge uh, he has these, these faults. Uh. If a person is not willing to admit your faults, uh, you will never improve. Uh, uh, so when another person uh, tells you your fault, uh, you should not try to defend yourself. Uh, but uh, uh, in the Buddha's uh, teachings, uh, that we should be uh, willing uh, to accept criticism, uh, to consider uh, whether uh, what people say about us uh, is reasonable or not. Uh, and he continues, Now friends, a monk should review himself thus, do I have evil wishes and am I dominated by evil wishes? If when he reviews himself he knows I have evil wishes, I am dominated by evil wishes, then he should make an effort to abandon those evil unwholesome states. But if when he reviews himself he knows I have no evil wishes, I am not dominated by evil wishes, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. Again, a monk should review himself thus, Do I praise myself and disparage others? Do I adhere to my own views, hold on to them tenaciously, uh, etc. So when he re reviews uh, himself, uh, then he knows uh, that he does not have, uh, if he has these uh, uh, evil qualities, uh, then he should make an effort to abandon those unwholesome states. Uh, and if he does not have them, uh, then he can be happy and glad, uh, training day and night, uh, to develop wholesome states uh, and abandon unwholesome states. Uh. Friends, when a monk reviews himself thus, if he sees that these evil unwholesome states are, n are not all abandoned in himself, then he should make an effort to abandon them all. But if when he reviews himself thus, he sees that they are all abandoned in himself, then he can abide happy and glad training day and night in wholesome states. Just as when a woman or a man, young, youthful, fond of ornaments, on viewing the image of her own face in a clear bright mirror or in a basin of clear water, sees a smudge or a blemish on it, she makes an effort to remove it. But if she sees no smudge or blemish on it, she becomes glad thus. It is a gain for me that it is clean. So too, when the monk reviews himself thus, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. This is what the Venerable Maha Moglana said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Maha Moglana's words. That's the end of the sutta. So here you see yeah, a senior monk like the Venerable Maha Moglana, he's trying to advise the younger monks huh, how to improve themselves. Huh. There's one thing uh, very good huh, about these suttas. Huh. They're all very practical. Huh. Very practical, and uh, if you 
uh, study them and uh, you find uh, that you can use them uh, to improve yourself and progress on the spiritual path. Uh, this is what the spiritual path is about, uh, to change our character for the better. Uh, even if you are not a monk, uh, even for lay people, uh, if you change yourself for the better, uh, then you find uh, that your life is well lived uh, at the end of your life. Uh, when you are about to pass away, uh, then you don't have remorse, uh, you don't uh, uh, have, um, be depressed about yourself. Uh, mm. Okay, the next sutta, number 16, Cheto Kila Sutta, the wilderness in the heart. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, that any monk who has not abandoned five wildernesses in the heart and has not severed five shackles in the heart, should come to growth, increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. This is impossible. What monks are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has not abandoned? Here a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the teacher. And thus his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving, that is the first wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Stop here for a moment. Here, this first one is doubtful, uh, unconfident about the teacher. This teacher here refers to the Buddha in the, in the, in the monks. For the monks during the Buddha's time, the only teacher is the Buddha. Again, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the Dhamma. As his mind does not incline to ardor, that is the second wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the Sangha. As his mind does not incline to ardor, that is the third wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Again, a monk is doubtful, uncertain, undecided and unconfident about the training. As, it, as his mind does not incline to ardor, that is the fourth wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So here, uh, first one is uh, doubtful about Buddha, second doubtful about the Dhamma, third doubtful about the Sangha, fourth doubtful about the training. The tra training here uh, normally refers to the training of sila, samadhi and panya, moral conduct, concentration and wisdom. You can also say this is a training in the Noble Eightfold Path. Mm. Again, a monk is angry and displeased with his companions in the holy life, resentful and callous towards them. And thus his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind does not incline to ardor, devotion, perseverance, striving, that is the fifth wilderness in the heart that he has not abandoned. These are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has not abandoned. Uh, see, here, see here the last one, uh, he is angry and displeased with his companions in the holy life. Uh, uh, a monk, uh, he should have good relationship uh, uh, with his uh, fellow monks uh, so that uh, they can help him and he can help them. And uh, helping each other, they can progress on the spiritual path. If, uh, as a monk, uh, uh, the Buddha says, uh, we, a monk has renounced, uh, he does not have a mother or a father to look after him. If, he, if, the, if monks do not look after themselves, uh, who is going to look after them? Uh, so, uh, having a friendship uh, with other monks uh, is uh, quite important. What monks are the five shackles in the heart that he has not severed? 
Here a monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for sensual pleasures. And thus his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the first shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Again, a monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for the body. As his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, that is the second shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Again, the monk is not free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for form. As, as his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the third shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Stop here for a moment. So here, the five shackles. Huh? The first one is craving for sensual pleasures. The second one is sensual pleasures means uh, craving for uh, pleasurable sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touch. Huh? Mm. And uh, the second one is craving for the body. Here, craving for the body refers to his own body. Huh? Mm. Uh, vain about his body. Huh? and uh, all that and the third one is craving for form here craving for form probably refers to other bodies uh, craving for other bodies uh, especially those of the opposite sex uh. again a monk eats as much as he likes until his belly is full and indulges in the pleasure of sleeping lolling and drowsing as his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving, that is the fourth shackle in the heart that he has not severed. Again, the monk lives the holy life, aspiring to some order of gods. Thus, by this virtue or observance or asceticism or holy life, I shall become a great god or some lesser god. And thus his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind does not incline to other devotion, perseverance, and striving, this is the fifth shackle in the heart that he has not severed. These are the five shackles in the heart that he has not severed. Monks, that any monk who has not abandoned these five wildernesses in the heart and, se and severed these five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. That is impossible. Dhamma, Dhamma Vinaya, you know, uh, is the teachings of the Buddha, uh, the Dhamma, the Suttas, and Vinaya is the uh, monastic discipline for monks. Uh. So here the five shackles uh, is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for his body, craving for other bodies, and eating too much. When we eat too much, uh, uh, we tend to become sleepy. Uh. Mm. If, we, if we are fat, nah, we tend to, to want to sleep more. Lah. But the more we sleep, nah, the more we want to sleep. Mm. Uh, so, uh, that's not good. Lah. Mm. If we want to uh, progress in the spiritual path, nah, we have to be a bit ascetic. Lah. Mm. Mm. Just sleep the minimum that we need. Lah. If we sleep too little, lah, also... Um, you won't uh, progress la. you sleep too much also so you have to know what is the minimum you require la. Mm. and then the last one is uh, living the holy life uh, aspiring to be some god uh, deva uh, so that uh, you have a good life uh, uh, so that being the case uh, you're not inclined to strive very hard in the, in the holy life la. so these are the five shackles la. Uh. Monks, that any monk who has abandoned five wildernesses in the heart and severed five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. That is possible. What monks are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has abandoned? Here, a monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided, or, or unconfident about the teacher. And thus, his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance, and striving, the first wilderness in the heart has been abandoned by him. Again, a monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided, or unconfident about the Dhamma. Number three, a, a, Again, the monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided, or unconfident about the Sangha. Number four, again, the monk is not doubtful, uncertain, undecided, or unconfident about the training. 
Number five, again, a monk is not angry and displeased with his companions in the holy life, nor resentful and careless towards them. And thus his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving, the fifth wilderness in the heart has been abandoned by him. These are the five wildernesses in the heart that he has abandoned. What monks are the five shackles in the heart that he has severed? Here a monk is free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for sensual pleasures, and thus his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance, and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance, and striving, the first shackle in the heart has been severed by him. Again, a monk is free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever, and craving for the body. And the, number three, again the monk is free from lust, desire, affection, thirst, fever and craving for form. That means other bodies. Huh? Number four, again a monk does not eat as much as he likes until his belly is full and does not indulge in the pleasures of sleeping, lolling and drowsing. Uh, number five, again a monk does not live the holy life aspiring to some order of God's thus, but this virtue or observance or asceticism or holy life I shall become a great God or some lesser God. And thus his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving. As his mind inclines to other devotion, perseverance and striving, the fifth shackle in the heart has been severed by him. These are the five shackles in the heart that he has severed. Monks, that any monk who has abandoned these five wildernesses in the heart and severed these five shackles in the heart should come to growth, increase and fulfillment in this Dhamma Vinaya. That is possible. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, the converse uh, for a monk uh, uh, is to uh, not have these five wildernesses uh, or these five shackles uh, in the heart, uh, and then he can progress uh, on the spiritual path. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of desire and determined striving. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of energy and determined striving. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of mind and determined striving. He develops the basis for psychic power consisting in concentration of investigation and determined striving. And enthusiasm is the fifth. Monks, uh, a monk who thus possesses the 15 factors including enthusiasm is capable of breaking out capable of enlightenment, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. Let's stop here for a moment. Uh. So these last five things, uh, uh, four of them uh, is the four idipada, uh, the um, basis uh, for psychic power. Uh, uh, and uh, the fifth one uh, the Buddha has an, uh, added uh, is enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm uh, to strive uh, in the holy life. Uh, uh. So, 15 factors means the five wildernesses, uh, the five shackles, uh, the four bases of psychic power, uh, idipadas, uh, plus enthusiasm, uh, that will be 15. Mm. Suppose there were a hen with 8, 10 or 12 eggs, which she had covered, incubated and nurtured properly. Even though she did not wish, oh, that my chicks might pierce their shells with the points of their claws and beaks and hatch out safely. Yet the chicks are capable of piercing their shells with the points of their claws and beaks and hatching out safely. So too, a monk who thus possesses the 15 factors, including enthusiasm, is capable of breaking out, capable of enlightenment, capable of attaining the supreme security from bondage. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were just satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, so here... The Buddha is saying uh, that uh, if a person wants to become enlightened, uh, he must not have these five wildernesses in the heart uh, or the five shackles in the heart. Uh, and then uh, he should have the four idipadas, the four bases of psychic power, uh, which means uh, determined striving uh, and concentration of desire, concentration of energy, concentration of mind and concentration of investigation. Investigation means investigation of the Dhamma uh, plus enthusiasm to strive. Uh, so when you, you don't have these uh, 
unwholesome states of, of wildernesses and shackles uh, and you make great effort uh, uh, you're enthusiastic to strive on the spiritual path uh, then uh, it is possible to in become enlightened uh, so this is another uh, sutta uh. Now we come to Sutta number 17, Vanapata Sutta, Jungle Tickets. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir or Bhante, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, I shall teach you a discourse on Jungle Tickets. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the monks replied. The Blessed One said this, Here monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket. While he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness does not become established. His unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated. His undestroyed taints or asavas uh, do not come to destruction. He does not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage. And also the requisites of life that should be obtained by one gone forth robes, arms, food, resting place and medicinal requisites are hard to come by. That monk should consider thus, I am living in this jungle thicket. While I am living here, my unestablished mindfulness does not become established. My unconcentrated mind does not become concentrate, concentrated. My undestroyed taints or asavas do not come to destruction. I do not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage. And also the requisites of life are hard to come by. That monk should depart from that jungle thicket that very night or that very day. He should not continue living there. Now stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that if a monk stays in a certain place uh, and he strives on the spiritual path, uh, but he is not making progress, uh, his, his unestablished mindfulness uh, does not become established. Uh, his mind does not become concentrated uh, and it does not destroy the asavas. Uh. The asavas refers to the uncontrolled mental outflows, uh, basically the flow of consciousness uh, 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 which, uh, because consciousness is that which creates the world. Uh. So, and also uh, the requisites are hard to come by, difficult to get. Uh. For example, if a monk stays in a, in a jungle place uh, full of uh, uh, snakes and uh, mosquitoes and, and creepy crawlies, uh, and it's very difficult to practice, uh, so he's not making progress. Uh, and also because he's staying so deep in the, in the forest, uh, uh, very difficult to get requisites. Uh. So the Buddha says uh, he should leave that very same day or night. Uh. Don't stay there. Uh. Mm. Here monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket. While he's living there, his unestablished mindfulness does not become established. His unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated. His undestroyed taints do not come to destruction. He does not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage. Yet the requisites of life that should be obtained by one gone forth are easy to come by. That monk could, should consider thus, I am living in this jungle thicket. While I am living here, my unestablished mindfulness does not become established. My unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated, etc. I do not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage. Yet the requisites of life that should be obtained by one gone forth are easy to come by. However, I did not go forth from the home life to homelessness for the sake of robes, arms, food, resting place and medicinal requisites. Moreover, while I am living here, my unestablished mindfulness does not become established. My unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated, etc. Having reflected thus, that monk should depart from that jungle thicket. He should not continue living there. I stop here for a moment. So here, the monk stays in a particular place uh, and he gets a lot of requisites. Uh, however, uh, he's not making progress. Uh, for example, uh, if he stays in a town monastery, uh, and uh, there's plenty of uh, support uh, from the lay people. Uh, 
Uh, he gets plenty of robes, plenty of good food, and uh, stays in an aircon room, etc. Having a good life. Uh. But he cannot progress on the spiritual path. Then the Buddha says uh, he should depart. Uh. Uh, not necessary to, to depart the same day, but he should depart uh, soon. Uh. Not to continue. Uh. Here monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket. While he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness becomes established. His unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated. His undestroyed taints come to destruction. He attains the unattained supreme security from bondage. Yet the requisites of life that should be obtained by one gone forth are hard to come by. The monk should consider thus, I am living in this jungle thicket. While I am living here, my unestablished mindfulness has become established. Mm. I have attained the unattained supreme security from bondage. Yet the requisites of life are hard to come by. However, I did not go forth from the home life into homelessness for the sake of robes, arms, food, resting place and medicinal requisites. Moreover, while I am living here, my unestablished mindfulness has become established, etc. I have attained the unattained supreme security from bondage. Having reflected thus, that monks should continue living in that jungle thicket. He should not depart. Uh, I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, this monk uh, is staying in uh, in the jungle, uh, uh, where it's very difficult to get the requisites, uh, uh, maybe insufficient food, uh, not much food, uh, or, or, or not so good quality food, uh, and uh, the other requisites also hard to come by. Uh. But he's making progress. Uh. Uh, for example, if a if a monk stays in the hills uh, and are supported by the hill tribes uh, are there the offerings of the requisites uh, the requisites are not 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 so good uh, but because he is in a very lonely place uh, he's making progress uh, then the buddha says uh, he should continue staying there uh, uh. here monks a monk lives in some jungle thicket while he's living there his unestablished mindfulness becomes established. His unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated. His undestroyed taints come to destruction. He attains his unattained supreme security from bondage. And also the requisites of life that should be obtained by one gone forth. Robes, arms, food, resting place and medicinal requisites are easy to come by. That monk should consider thus, I am living in this jungle thicket. While I am living here, my unestablished mindfulness has become established. I have attained the unattained supreme security from bondage. And also the requisites of life are easy to come by. That monk should continue living in that jungle thicket as long as life lasts. He should not depart. Hmm. So this fourth one, this monk stays in this uh, jungle place. Huh? The requisites are quite well provided. And also he makes progress on the spiritual path. Then the Buddha says, uh, that is the ideal. Stay there until the end of life. Don't go anywhere. Uh. And then the Buddha repeats the same uh, four things, uh, four conditions uh, for different places. Uh, here monks, a monk lives in dependence upon a certain village. And again, these four conditions. Uh, he stays in a certain village and he does not progress and the requisites are hard to come by. Uh, then he should uh, depart the very same day. Uh. And then secondly, he stays in a certain place, in a certain village. Uh, uh, he does not progress, uh, but there is a uh, plentiful supply of requisites. He should still depart. Uh. Third, he stays in a place where the requ requisites are not much. Uh. Uh, and but he is making progress la. so the Buddha says he should continue staying there fourth uh, he stays in this village uh, and he is making progress uh, and the requisites are also easy to get uh. then the Buddha says he should stay there in the, uh, until the end of life la. similarly here a monk lives in dependence upon a certain town uh, the same four condition here a monk lives in dependence upon a certain city also the same four condition here, monks, a monk lives in dependence upon a certain country. Again, the four conditions. Uh. So here, these are all talking about a place. Uh, what is a suitable place for a monk? Uh, so according to, to the sutta here, what is a suitable place, suitable place for a monk uh, is where he makes progress. Uh. Uh, ideally, if he makes progress uh, and he gets a lot of requisites, uh, that is ideal. Uh. 
and the sutta continues. Here monks, a monk lives in dependence upon a certain person, that means a certain teacher, a certain acharya or achan. And then, uh, uh, um, as before, uh, uh, he lives in independence upon a certain teacher uh, and he does not make progress. Uh, and also the requisites are hard to come by. Uh, and then the, the Buddha says, uh, that monk should depart from that teacher without taking leave. He should not continue following him. Then the second uh, teacher, here monks, a monk lives in dependence upon a certain person, a certain teacher. Uh, and then staying there, he, he does not make progress, uh, but plenty of requisites. Uh, having reflected thus that monk should depart from that person after taking leave, he should not continue following him. And the third one, here monks, a monk lives in dependence upon a certain person, a certain teacher, and he makes progress, but the requisites are hard to come by. Lah. Having reflected thus, that monk should continue following that person, he should not depart. Number four, here monks, a monk lives in dependence upon a certain teacher, and then uh, he makes progress, uh, and also the requisites are plentiful. Lah. That monk should continue following that person as long as life lasts. He should not depart from him, even if told to go away. Uh, that is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, so this sutta is again another very practical sutta. Uh, the first part is telling you uh, uh, what is a suitable place to stay. Uh, if you stay in a certain cave or a certain forest or in a certain secluded place, uh, and you are making progress, uh, the Buddha says, continue staying there. Uh, but if you are not making progress, uh, then leave, uh, the Buddha says. Similarly, if you follow a certain teacher and you make progress, uh, then you should stay with him. Uh. Even if he chases you away, so you, <laughs> you don't run away. <laughs> Kicks you out of the door, so you crawl back. <laughs> Uh, but if you are not making progress, uh, then uh, even though he asks you to stay, uh, you should leave. Uh, so that is the uh, Buddha's teachings. Uh, so it's very clear uh, where to stay, which, what teacher to follow. Uh. Number 18, Sutta number 18, uh, Majjima Nikaya, Madhu Pindika Sutta, the honey ball. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country at Kapilavatu in the Nigroda Spa. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Kapilavatu for arms. The outer robe is what you're wearing. Uh, this is a shivon, this is the outer robe. Mm. When he had wandered for arms in Kapilavatu and had returned from his arms round, after his meal he went to the great wood for the day's abiding, and entering the great wood, sat down at the root of a bilva sapling for the day's abiding. Dandapani, the Sakyan, while walking and wandering for exercise, also went to the great wood. And when he had entered the great wood, he went to the bilva sapling, where the Blessed One was, and exchanged greetings with him. When this, court, when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side, leaning on his stick, and asked the Blessed One, What does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? And the Buddha said, Friend, I assert and proclaim that one, I, I, I assert and proclaim such that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas. In this generation, with its recluses and Brahmins, its princes and its people, such that perceptions no more underlie that Brahmana who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. I stop here for a moment. Nah. So here, uh, the Buddha is asked, "What does he teach?" Lah. Then the Buddha says, nah, "He teaches that." Nah, uh, he teaches such uh, that he does not quarrel with anyone. Uh. And also uh, his teaching uh, is such uh, that perceptions no more underlie the Brahmana. Here the Brahmana, this word Brahmana originally referred to the Brahmana caste, uh, the Brahmin caste. Uh. Uh, so uh, originally uh, the Brahmana caste uh, were ascetics. Uh, uh, Ascetics, recluses. Lah. So, 
later they uh, were employed by the king la, to be advisors. La. So they did not practice the spiritual path anymore. La. So later that they, this Brahmana caste came to be called Brahmins. La. But uh, this word Brahmana can mean the Brahmin caste as was used originally. Uh, or it can mean uh, the religious person, uh, the ascetic uh, or the recluse or the monk. Uh, uh. So here when the word Brahmana is used, uh, it means uh, the, the, the religious man. Uh. So the Buddha says uh, that his teaching is such that perceptions no more underlie the Brahmana who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. Mm. When this was said, Dandapani the Sakyan shook his head, wagged his tongue and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered in three lines. Then he departed, leaning on his stick. Obviously he didn't know what the Buddha was talking about. Nah. He was so <laughs> bewildered. Nah. Then when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to Negroda's park where he sat down on a seat made ready for him and told the monks what had taken place. Then a certain monk asked the Blessed One, But Venerable Sir, what is that the Blessed One asserts whereby one does not quarrel with anyone in the world with its gods, its maras and brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people? And Venerable Sir, how is it that perceptions no more underline that brahmana who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. So here this monk also didn't understand, so he asked the Buddha to explain. And the Buddha said, Monks, as to the source through which perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome or hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice and false speech. Here these evil and wholesome states cease without remain remainder. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said, said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. So here the Buddha says uh, that source uh, from which perceptions and notions arise, uh, if nothing is uh, delighted in there, uh, if you do not delight in that source, uh, welcome or hold on to it. Uh, that is the end of the underlying tendencies to lust, aversion, etc. Then soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered, Now friends, the Blessed One has arisen from his seat and gone into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. Now who will expound this in detail? Then they considered, The memorable Maha Kachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and asked him the meaning of this. Then the monks went to the venerable Maha Kachana and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down to one side and told they sat down to one side and told him what had taken place, adding, Let the venerable Maha Kachana expound it to us. The Venerable Maha Kachana replied, Friends, it is as though a man needing hardwood, seeking hardwood, wandering in search of hardwood, thought that hardwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of hardwood, after he had passed over the root and the trunk. So it is with you, Venerable Sirs, that you think that I should be asked about the meaning of this, after you pass the Blessed, by, the blessed One by when you were face to face with the teacher, for knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma, he is the Holy One, he is the Sayer, the Proclaimer, the Elucidator of Meaning, the Giving of the Deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told you, so 
you should have remembered it. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, remember Mahakachana is saying, uh, you had the Buddha in front of you and you never asked him. Uh, it's just like uh, the hardwood is in front of you uh, and you don't know uh, that it is hardwood. You go and look for the leaves and the branches, uh, which is worthless. Uh. So he's saying, uh, I'm like the leaves and the branches. Uh. The Buddha is the, is, is, is the enlightened one. Uh. Why you ask me? Uh. Then they said, surely friend Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, etc. The Tathagata. That was the time and we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told us, so we should have remembered it. Yet the Venerable Maha Kachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. The Venerable Maha Kachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expound with given in brief by the Blessed One without expounding the detailed meaning. Let the Venerable Maha Kachana expound it without without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, monks replied. The Venerable, the Venerable Maha Kachana said, Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, monks, as to the source to which perceptions and notions tinge my mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, etc. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons. Here those evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of it to be as follows. Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the tree is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation beset a man with respect to past, future and present forms recognizable to the eye. Dependent on the ear and sounds, dependent on the nose and odors, dependent on the tongue and flavors, body and tangibles, dependent on the mind and mind objects, uh, similarly, the meeting of the tree is contact. With contact, as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation beset a man with respect to past, future, and present. Uh, so, here... I stop you for a moment. So here, what uh, the Venerable Maha Kachana is saying uh, is that our six uh, sense bases uh, has these uh, six um, uh, sense objects. Uh. So the meeting of the sense object uh, with the sense base uh, uh, causes the consciousness to arise. Uh. So when consciousness arises. Uh, 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 this is followed by feeling, uh, perception, uh, proliferation. Uh, uh, mm, so that's basically what he says. Uh, so it is the contact uh, of the sense object uh, with the sense base uh, that uh, uh, causes this uh, feeling, perception, etc. to arise. Uh. And he continues, when there is the eye, a form and eye consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there is the manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of feeling. When there is the manifestation of feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation. Similarly, when there is the ear sound and ear consciousness, when there is the nose odor and nose consciousness, etc., uh, it is possible to point out um, uh, the manifestation of feeling, perception, uh, thinking, um, 
etc mental proliferation when there is no i no form and no i consciousness it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact when there is no manifestation of contact it is impossible to to point out the manifestation of feeling when there is no manifestation of feeling it is impossible to point out the manifestation of perception when there is no manifestation of perception it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking when there is no manifestation of thinking it is impossible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation Similarly, when there is no ear, no sound, and no ear consciousness, no nose, no odor, and no nose consciousness, etc. So here, uh, basically, what he is saying uh, is that um, when there is the uh, sense bases uh, and the sense objects, uh, uh, feeling, uh, perception, uh, thinking, etc., arise. Uh, but when there is no uh, sense base. and no sense object na then there is no contact no uh, so uh, no uh, because of no contact there is no feeling uh, no perception no thinking no mental proliferation uh. friends when the blessed one rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning that is monks as to the source to which perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation beset a man if nothing is found there to delight in welcome and hold to that is the end of the underlying tendency to lust of the underlying tendency to aversion of the underlying tendency to views of the underlying tendency to doubt of the underlying tendency to conceit of the underlying tendency to desire for being of the underlying tendency to ignorance this is the end of resorting to rods and weapons of quarrels brawls disputes recrimination malice and false speech here these evil and wholesome states cease without remainder I understand the detailed meaning of this summary to be thus now friends if you wish go to the blessed one and ask him about the meaning of this as the blessed one explains it to you so should you remember it Then the monks, having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Mahakachana's words, rose from their seats and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down to one side and told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he had left, adding, "Then, venerable sir, we went to the venerable Mahakachana and asked him about the meaning." Venerable Mahakachana expounded the mean to, meaning to us with these terms, statements, and phrases. And the Buddha said, "Mahakachana is wise, monks." Mahakachana has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the same way that Mahakachana explained it. Such is the meaning of this. So should you remember it. When this was said, the member Ananda said to the Blessed One, "Venerable Sir, just as if a man exhausted by hunger and weakness came upon a honey ball, in the course of eating it, he of eating it, he would find a sweet, delectable flavor." So too, venerable sir, any able-minded monk, in the course of scrutinizing with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma, would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable sir, what is the name of this discourse on the Dhamma? As to that, Ananda, you may remember this discourse on the Dhamma as the honey ball discourse. That is what the Blessed One said. The venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, at the end of the sutta. So basically, here, I guess when the Buddha says uh, that, uh, uh, firstly, yeah, uh, he, I, uh, when he teaches the Dhamma, he does not quarrel with anyone in the world. There is one sutta, one interesting sutta. I'm not sure whether it's Sangutra Nikaya or Sangyutta Nikaya. I forgot uh, where the Buddha says. Uh, uh, The world quarrels with me. I do not quarrel with the world. He who teaches the Dhamma does not quarrel with the world. Why does the Buddha say he does not quarrel with the world? Because I think a lot of external set teachers uh, found fault uh, with the Buddha, uh, so they want to quarrel with the Buddha, saying uh, criticize the Buddha and all that. But the Buddha says uh, because when the Buddha taught the Dhamma, he contradicted a lot of other teachings. Uh, So, because he contradicted a lot of other teachings, uh, the other external sect teachers uh, were not happy with him, lah. Uh, so they 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 found fault with him, criticized him, and all that, lah. 
So as he says, do uh, he has a big quarrel with them. Uh, but the Buddha says, uh, he does not quarrel with them. They quarrel with me. The Buddha says, uh, he who teaches the Dhamma does not quarrel with the world. Uh. So here the Buddha says, uh, he does not quarrel with anyone. Secondly, uh, he says uh, that uh, he teaches such a teaching uh, that perceptions no more underlie the Brahmana, the holy man, uh, who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving. So the Buddha's teaching uh, is such uh, that uh, if a monk uh, practices it, uh, then he abides detached from sensual pleasures. Uh, and when he is detached from sensual pleasures, uh, then he is without uh, the perceptions, uh, perplexity, worries, uh, craving for any kind of being. Uh. Uh, also, later the Buddha said, uh, as to the source to which perceptions and notions tinge by mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold on to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, to aversion, to views, to doubt, etc. So here, I guess, uh, what he's saying, uh, uh, the source uh, from which perceptions and notions arise uh, is the sense objects, uh, sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, and thoughts. If we delight in those things, because we tend to delight in worldly, worldly things, like beautiful sights, rock music, perfume, good food, and all that, we delight in these worldly things. Then the underlying tendency to lust, aversion, views, doubt, everything, uh, all arise. Uh, so the Buddha says uh, that if we, uh, if, if we uh, do not delight in these, uh, these things, uh, the source uh, of all these uh, mental proliferations, uh, uh, that is the end of uh, uh, quarrels and brawls and disputes, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, we stop here for tonight. Sutta number 18, not the chapter, Sutta. Hmm. Not cut, we don't delight in, in it. No. Don't delight, don't cling in uh, sights, sounds, smells and all that. No. Hmm. The Buddha says somewhere uh, that uh, the cause of uh, the round of rebirths uh, is craving, uh, craving for uh, delighting in this and that. No. We, the normal person, uh, um, because life is very boring, life is Buddha says, uh, life is Dukkha. So for the normal person, uh, we are always trying to find amusement. Uh, you delight in this. Uh. If you just stay at home and do nothing, it's so boring. I uh, must watch the Astro, or you watch the football, or you or go out, uh, karaoke, uh, at least uh, also te tare. <laughs> uh, go and simbang, simbang. Uh. So we distract ourselves uh, from the Dukkha, because uh, if you if you if you just do nothing, uh, then you feel dukkha. Uh, life is dukkha, so we find unbearable. Uh, so we tend to um, want to look for uh, pleasure here and there. Uh, that's why the Buddha say, always delighting in this and that, uh, changing. Uh, you you enjoy something also after some time, uh, it becomes boring already. And you get more of it, nah, it becomes a nuisance already. For example, you listen to music. Nah, nah, the music is very nice. Nah. But it plays non-stop. Nah, you find it irritating already. <laughs> if it plays 24 hours a day, nah, it's suffering already. Nah. So you have to change. Nah, you know? have to change. So that's why we always delight in this and that. Nah, always changing. Nah. It's just that uh, for the normal person, nah, we don't have the Buddha's instructions uh, for a normal person who does not know the Dhamma. Does not, they does not know how to analyze, how to see this. Or because we have the Buddha's instructions and uh, the Buddha tells us, uh, then, we, then we go and observe, yeah, la, life is like that. Hmm? H e a r t heart wood is supposed to be the the very core, isn't it? The the deepest part of the wood, na. 
which the deepest part of the wood will be the oldest la. Uh, being the oldest it will be the hardest la. Mm. that's why it's called hard wood the very heart of it la. Mm. actually we go back to Nagina uh, Nikaya 17 uh, where the Buddha described the four conditions where you, uh, a monk should stay yeah. uh, or leave um, just to to was that really how long would a man stay to really know that he has his progressing or what? Because you get to see many men, they go from one place to another and, and how would they know whether they are progressing or whether they are given the place of the teacher a chance to really help them cultivate? Uh, you are asking how long is it? Yeah, yeah, because if a man were to stay in a place very short while, for a very short uh, while, how would he be able to gauge whether he's progressing or not? Um, certain things, how to gauge, for example, the teacher, uh, there are certain things that are obvious, you know, certain things are obvious, for example, you see, the teacher uh, is Vinaya, is very bad. Uh, uh, he's very greedy and uh, his temper is very uh, very nasty and all these things. Uh. So it's so obvious. Uh, the Buddha says uh, um, a new monk, uh, is, uh, when he goes to stay with the teacher, uh, he's supposed to ask for Nisaya. Ask for Nisaya means ask for dependence. Uh. He wants to be dependent upon the teacher. Uh. And but the Buddha says uh, first he has to observe uh, maybe four or five days, uh, uh, and if he finds the teacher, uh, it's very obvious uh, that the teacher is greedy and uh, does not practice and uh, does not meditate and uh, and has a lot of uh, bad qualities. Uh, and then after four or five days, if he sees that, uh, the Buddha says, uh, then you don't take dependence, uh, you leave. Uh, it's stated in the Vinaya book, but. If that is not obvious, uh, then uh, if a monk stays with the teacher, in the Vinaya, it is uh, stated uh, that if an external sect ascetic uh, who was following some other external sect teacher, uh, he comes and wants to become a monk. Uh. So the Buddha says, uh, firstly, uh, he, is, he, he, he has to, he has to uh, do this... Uh, this probationary period uh, of about four months. Uh. During these four months, uh, the monks will observe him, uh, whether he has given up some of his uh, uh, wrong views. Uh. Uh, so he has give, if he, uh, within the, uh, in the four months, uh, if he is willing to change his wrong views uh, and uh, to learn the Dhamma, uh, then the Buddha says, uh, after four months, uh, the monks can accept him. Uh and accept him for, uh, and ordain him. Lah. So, uh, in the monk's Vinaya, it would appear like uh, four months is a reasonable time uh, to know a person, to gauge a person. Uh. So, whether he's gauging a disciple or gauging a teacher, a uh, uh, period of four months uh, is reasonable. Lah. Mm. But sometimes, uh, uh, for some people, uh, um, four months, uh, the, 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 how do you say, the unwholesome qualities uh, do not, uh, it's not so obvious, uh, don't surface. Uh. Sometimes it takes longer than that uh, to, to, to know that person well. That's why in the suttas, the Buddha says uh, that uh, to know a person really uh, uh, deep inside, uh, you have to associate with him for a long time. And not only that, uh, uh, you, 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 you have to live with him and associate him with him uh, for a long time. And also you have to be very sharp. Uh. You have to be very observant uh, to know a person. Uh, so, for some people, uh, it takes longer. Uh. Mm. Okay. Mm. One day, what about a place? Uh, I say a man go to a place mm. to stay. Mm. Uh, how would you know whether it's 
say if you keep moving about how they you know whether that day is suitable for him to cultivate, would, would it be like a running moment also that to be able to know whether that day is suitable for him to, to progress to it? In the same way, la, there are certain things uh, that you can see quite immediately la, after staying for a few days. Uh, you can see immediately. La. Uh, uh, certain things are uh, not so obvious. It takes longer to see. La. Mm. For example, if a, a monk goes to a monastery uh, where all the monks are not interested in meditation, after staying just a few days, uh, you know uh, that all the monks there are not interested in meditation. If you try to to, to, to be more hardworking, uh, then uh, you're gonna gain, uh, you're gonna clash with the other monks. Uh. So then you, you have to run away, la. <laughs> uh, so. mm. Thank you. Uh, the sutra that is the to the sixth. Is this more than the seven factors of enlightenment? Uh, twenty-six, sir. Uh. Uh, um, this is the four idipada. The four idipada uh, come under the 37 requisites of enlightenment. Uh. Uh, sita, the same Sita. Uh, the Buddha says that the, uh, the man who has uh, the unwholesome quality of craving for sensual uh, pleasure, that he would be. I would, I would guess that craving uh, for food, overeating and uh, oversleeping are also sexual pleasure. I was wondering why the Buddha specifically point out this too, when he also already, when he had already mentioned craving uh, for sexual pleasure. In this case, it might be like sexual pleasure, lah. Huh? Uh, like. Uh, uh, Liking to see uh, somebody of the opposite sex, liking to talk to somebody of the opposite sex, and all this thing. Mm. I'm asking this question on behalf. Uh, um, if you, in your previous life, had lots of bad karma, you did lots of bad karma, in this very life, if you uh, undertake, um, you start to do many meritorious deeds. Does that cancel out the previous life's karma? It is not uh, cancelling out. Uh, in the Buddha's teachings, whatever karma we create uh, cannot be cancelled. Uh, either it ripens uh, as vipaka, or it has the potential to ripen. Uh, but not all karma will ripen, the Buddha says. Uh. It is the heavy karmas uh, uh, that will ripen first. Uh. So the Buddha says, uh, if we don't want our evil karma to ripen, uh, then we have to do a lot of good deeds. Uh. When we do a lot of good deeds, uh, then we become happy. Uh, and those, those good deeds that we do uh, will immediately give us happiness and, and we forgot about the evil karma. So when we, for, when we for, forgot about the evil karma, it does not ripen. Uh, karma ripening is when we remember it. When we remember it, only uh, you feel remorse and you, you, you suffer for it. Uh, so, if you, so the Buddha says, uh, you, we, we, we do a lot of good deeds. Uh. Now, doing good deeds, uh, the simplest is uh, charity. Uh, but because it's the simplest, uh, the merit is the least. Uh, slightly more difficult uh, is keeping sila, uh, moral conduct. Uh, that is more difficult to do, so the merit is more. And then, uh, better than that, uh, is to practice the spiritual path. Uh, study, the, study the Dhamma and change your character. Uh, try to change. Look at your own faults. Uh, if, if you... Uh, uh, too greedy for, for food, don't eat so much. Lo. If you are too greedy for sleep, don't sleep so much. Lo. Uh, if you have bad temper, try to change your, your bad temper. Uh, but the, then uh, it's difficult to change ourselves uh, if our mind is not strong. That's why we need to meditate. When we meditate, the mind becomes stronger. And we can see more clearly our thoughts. And we have the strength of mind to change. Uh, uh. So, 
uh, the practicing the spiritual path uh, and because it's the hardest, uh, the, mer the merit is the greatest. Uh. So like during the Buddha's time, uh, we had a bandit called Angulimala. He killed uh, hundreds of people. So uh, he, was, he, would, he would have gone down to hell. Uh, but the Buddha uh, saw uh, that this person had the potential. So the Buddha went to him, uh, taught him the Dhamma and he became a monk. After he became a monk, uh, he strove very hard because he knew uh, Buddha warned him uh, that <laughs> hell was waiting for him. So he strove so hard uh, that he became an Arahant. After he became an Arahant, uh, he did not have to pay all that uh, evil karma in hell. Mm. So that's why uh, spiritual path, uh, the merit is the greatest. Uh. Mm. Okay. Um. I think Buddha has a preference for younger people to go to the monk. Uh, and I think he cited some reasons why the elderly are not so suitable. I cannot recollect what the size of the reason why. Uh, but I think he is a good For example, like, yeah, it's slow, <laughs> hard to teach, and so on. Uh, when we are young, uh, we have more energy, we have more enthusiasm. Uh. So, when we become a monk early in life, uh, we, we are fit, uh, so we can go and stay in the forest uh, uh, and uh, stand the cold, sleep on the bare ground. Uh, we stand the wind and all that. No? Like last time I used to like to stay in caves. La. And you know sometimes I stay in caves and there's a constant breeze la, going through the cave. Mm. But when I meditated and uh, the body becomes so hot, na, then uh, very strong wind or so uh, I can stand. You, know? you feel like your body is on fire like that and I can stand very strong wind. But at the age of 45, I noticed uh, the wind got into my bones. <laughs> Uh, so at the age of 45, you cannot stand. Uh, the, 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 our chi, our vital energy uh, starts to decrease. Uh. Also, when we grow old, uh, we have very strong uh, patterns. Uh, as we, you know, every day, uh, our uh, way of thinking uh, becomes ingrained in us. Uh. Uh, so as they say, uh, uh, old bamboo is harder to bend. Young bamboo is easier to bend. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when you are old, uh, you have uh, more fixed views, you know. Uh, so there's a sutta. There's a sutta where the Buddha says uh, sometimes a certain come person uh, comes into monkhood, uh, and then uh, uh, because he has just come into monkhood, uh, the more senior monks uh, will tell him, "You cannot do this. You must do it in this way," and all these things. Uh, and then he thinks to, his, to himself, uh, "This young." Young fellow, uh, he can be my son or my grandson. Uh, he's teaching me uh, this and that. Uh. Uh, so, uh, uh, Chinese say, I've uh, eaten more salt than he has eaten rice. <laughs> so you, you cannot stand. Uh, you cannot stand being too old by a young monk. Uh, but he may be young in age, but uh, in seniority, uh, he may be older than you. That's why he has a right to tell you off. Uh, so that's another reason. Uh, so also as we uh, grow older, uh, because our faculties become weaker, uh, it's harder to uh, sit straight and meditate. You know? The mind also becomes weaker already. After 60, uh, uh, even some people after 50, uh, the mind uh, becomes uh, weaker. So it's very hard to concentrate you know you see like when the Buddha was practicing the ascetic uh, practices uh, he ate so little uh, the Buddha said uh, there's a stage where he ate one grain of rice a day so he was so weak uh, that uh, he could not he did not have the strength uh, to enter samadhi to enter jhana so later when he realized uh, that the path out of samsara uh, is samadhi uh, he wanted to attain the jhanas again uh, then he found uh, that he has to make his body stronger. Uh, so he took one meal a day uh, instead of one grain of rice a day. Uh, he took one 
one uh, full meal a day and then when his body was strong enough uh, then he could uh, concentrate and enter samadhi uh. so as we grow older uh, our faculties become weaker it's more difficult uh, for an old man uh, to enter samadhi unless uh, in the younger days uh, he has already attained it uh. if at the age of 30 something or 40 something you have attained it uh, later when you are practicing at the age of 70 you can still attain it because you already uh, you have the blaze uh, trail already uh. but they asked this question because i heard that in thailand to stop uh, elderly people for 60 to join the monastery and also in malaysia uh, I think that there is no general rule like this. In the Vinaya, uh, the Buddha says, uh, if a person is uh, too old uh, until he has become feeble, uh, feeble and he needs to be looked after and all that, uh, then uh, he is not allowed to ordain. Uh, becomes, he becomes a liability. Uh, 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 so... Uh, there is no limit spoken by the Buddha. Eh? It seems like, uh, according to the uh, Buddhist books, uh, even uh, there was somebody who was 120 years old also could become an Arahan uh, in the Theragata or somewhere. Lah, uh. So, of course, that is an exceptional case. Lah, uh. So, uh, you find uh, certain monasteries uh, which are very well supported and they have too many monks. Uh, and then they impose more stringent conditions. I remember many years ago, uh, this Wat Damakaya in Bangkok, uh, Thailand. Uh, they have a lot of graduates, you know, coming to become monks. And they have a lot of monks. A lot of them are, are graduates. Uh, and then they impose stricter conditions. Uh, after 40, they don't accept. Uh, after 40 years old, they don't accept. Uh, they can afford to. Uh, uh, when you can't afford to and you don't have monks, uh, then you accept. Uh, uh, old guys as well. Eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it depends on the market, eh? they say. Okay, you just say, you know, people like us, you know, in our 60s, late 60s, <coughs> there's no chance at all of entering the Mangu, even though you want to. It depends on your what uh, lah. Age is one thing. Another thing is uh, uh, there are other qualities uh, that make a person uh, suitable or not suitable to become a monk. Uh. For example, we had one old man helping us, you know, uh, on our pindapata and all this thing. Uh. He was very supportive, uh, and he's about seventy years old, and. I asked him to come and become a monk because uh, he has those qualities. La. He, he's a very sincere person, very interested in the Dharma and all that, but he could not let go. Could not let go. just <laughs> <laughs> one, one last one for me. Um, my purpose of coming uh, to do this Kamagara is uh, to prepare myself for the next time. One yeah, this is the last train already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We catch the last train before we use the train. Mm. So, you know, in this life at 70, you can't do very much, but at least you make an effort to start, yeah. start doing, you know, activating. Mm. You can go far, you go, you can't, at least the next life there's some better opportunity. Yeah. Because I know, you know, some young man, he can wear the rope instantly. Last night, maybe they were all big monks. Like me, so difficult. Never been monk before, I think. <laughs> so this is my purpose of uh, becoming a uh, Samanera, and I've had many other places also. Samanera also. <laughs> mm. uh, so I just take a day at a time, yeah. because time is difficult. Yeah, like you can do this three months, it's very good. Ma. Those that are two weeks, uh, not, not, not much meaning, la, because two weeks you can't do anything, you can't learn anything. is uh, how do the senior, more senior monks uh, admonish each other. Um, well, in the Vinaya, I stated uh, that if we 
want to advise another monk, we have to ask permission first, lah. Uh, whether he, uh, he uh, asked for permission to to say something, lah. And then uh, if he if he allows you, uh, then only you can say. Lah. Mm. And after that, if but firstly, even before we want to say anything, uh, we have to gauge this person whether he's willing to uh, to be admonished or not. If he's not willing to be admonished, uh, there's, there's no point. Uh. Now, whether it's a monk or a lay person, also the same. Uh. If you want to admonish another person, uh, you have to see whether he can accept or not. Whether he's willing to change or not. He's not willing to change, no point. Mm, you're wasting your, your breath. Just like in the suttas we read, uh, this uh, Sangyuta Nikaya, the monk who went to the forest to practice, then he saw this hunter hunting, uh, killing uh, animals, and then this monk tried to admonish him. Uh, of course, he didn't listen. Uh. Then after that, the deva came to tell off this monk, don't waste your time go ahead and try to admonish this type of person. He's not going to listen to you. He's not going to change his ways. Uh, so in the same way, to see if that person wants to change, if that person wants to change, then we help him, lah, tell him his fault. doesn't want to change, we don't tell him. We sting our breath and get, you create an enemy or so. <laughs> No, because uh, if we are having a discussion, uh, then everybody can express their view. Uh, uh, so it's all right to say. Uh. But uh, in the Vinaya, if some uh, among the monks, uh, somebody want, wants to teach the Dhamma or wants to teach the Vinaya, it, it is the most senior monk uh, who is expected to, to do the teaching. Uh. And if uh, the other monks want a, a more junior monk to speak, uh, then the junior monk has to ask permission from the senior monk. Uh, and then the senior monk gives him permission, then only he can teach the Dhamma. Uh. Okay, let's say it's just a normal Dhamma discussion between two fellow monks. Uh, then if it's just discussion, it's okay. But right. the other person will regard this person, and this person get very angry or, or express that he, he is more senior and the other person is not He should not. Nah, if he want to discuss, nah, then he should be free to express himself. Uh, but... Uh, the fact that the, 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 the senior monk uh, is willing to discuss with the junior monk uh, shows uh, that he values his opinion. Uh. That's not. No, otherwise, he... Uh, mm. I've had a senior monk come to me also to discuss Dhamma. So, in, I mean, when he comes to me, I speak freely. Uh. <laughs> Okay, stop for now, huh? getting late, huh?